from Two Keto LLC. It's Keto Woman Podcast with Daisy Brackenhall. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. Keto has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. Each week I'll be chatting to inspirational women, maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner, right? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs to 20 grams or less per day, so things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like dairy. Moderate protein scale to your lean body mass and then fat to satiety. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you. Make your own personalised keto. I'll be asking my guests each week what their keto looks like to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor, most of my guests won't be either, so we can't give you medical advice. It's always best to work with your own doctor because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. This feels like a good time to do a shout out to Kelly. Thanks Kelly for supporting me and this podcast by making a pledge at my Patreon page. Do you want to hear your name here at the top of the show? Are you enjoying this podcast and would like to help me make more episodes? Then head to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Keto Woman or hit the support button on the Keto Women podcast website. It means a great deal to me and you will get to headline the show just like Kelly. This week's extraordinary woman is Karen Parrott. Karen lives in Carlsbad, California with her teenage daughter and two tortoiseshell cats. She's a clinical laboratory scientist, and when she's not commuting and cooking her own food, she likes to practice her photography and also enjoys coastal walking and beachcombing. She was obese or yo-yo dieting from the age of 6 to 46. In 2012, Karen combined an abstaining plan with a paleo food template, progressing to low carb and finally to keto with time-restricted eating. It was that final combination where she was able to find a stable weight, normal blood glucose readings, and put her binge eating into remission. She was also able to apply her DNA results to take advantage of health insurance discounts and reduce joint pain. She has now maintained a normal weight for almost six years. I had a real aha moment during my chat with Karen, and I'm going to put her ideas into practice really soon. So without further ado, let's hear that interview now. Welcome, Karen, to the Keto Women podcast. How are you doing today? Well, hi, Daisy. Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. I really enjoy telling uh, my story and talking to people and uh, learning and also just speaking my truth. Excellent. Well, that's what you're here for. So... Without further ado, why don't you tell the listeners a bit about yourself? Well, hi, everybody. My name is Karen Parrott, and I am a 51-year-old woman living in Southern California. I have uh, my daughter part-time, half-time, and I have two cats. More importantly, I have come to this place by being obese when I was younger, from about ages 6 to 46, and now, starting at age 46, I made a, a large change with my diet. And what I didn't realize back in 2011, going into early 2012, is that I was using a mild form of keto to lose the weight. And I felt great. I had lost the weight before using a points counting system right before I was pregnant in 2000. She's now 17, getting ready to go to college. But, and that seemed to work great when I was in my mid thirties. 
But as I got a little older, and also I went through just a, a huge period of stress of, as an adult, and uh, when I separated and divorced, and I kind of went through a period of, I'm just going to eat anything I want. And then I had a period of 10 to 20 or 10 to 12 maybe attempts at points counting that just didn't work. And I had a person who was close to me, he passed away suddenly. And he was just two years older than me at the time. He was 48 and I was 46. So I had a chance to enroll in a program via my workplace. And at the time, I didn't realize, I, I think they did mention that there was a mild ketosis as to not scare us because back in 2011 and 2012, uh, nobody was talking about keto. And I was on that plan for about 40 weeks and I lost 70 pounds and I felt wonderful. Now, during that time, I read a book called Refuse to Regain by Barbara Berkeley, MD, and she had some good recommendations. But also at that time, I was on Twitter. I was an early Twitter adopter, not the earliest, but early on. And I saw that she was uh, talking to Rob Wolf back and forth. I, in 1997, I had Hashimoto's disease, uh, thyroid disease before I gave birth. So I got balanced out on the thyroid hormones, which was uh, a blessing because I felt much better. Now I picked up Rob's book and read Dr. Berkeley's book and Rob's book at the same time. And I realized that the plan I was on was upping their prices or they recommended uh, additional supplementation with their products. Their products were very expensive and I was si saving money to send my daughter to college. So this was a program. This was, this was, um, like a replacement shake program or, it or was. something like that. A meal, meal replacements. It was. It was one of those programs and you ate, uh, five packages of theirs and then had a lean and green meal every night. And the lean and green meal was pretty tasty. During that f 40 weeks, I really realized that my binge urges were totally shut off. And I didn't realize it at the time, but the lower carb and the keto really had me feeling so much better. Crikey, but you did it for a long time then. You had a meal a day, but you, you were doing that for 40 weeks. Yes, 40 weeks. I call it a birth in reverse because right. <laughs> yeah. I think I probably gained 70 pounds when I was pregnant. And then you know, over 40 weeks. So it, 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 it was wonderful. I lost at a rate of about 2.2 pounds a week. So I lost at a very even rate. Um, during the points counting time, I could only lose at 0 0.8. Now, I'll, I'm not sure if that was due to my thyroid. I also had trouble with binge urges because I was moderating during the points counting era. And uh, the package plan helped me understand abstaining a lot more. And that's the cornerstone kind of of my uh, weight maintenance uh, keto program is ab abstaining from things that give me binge urges. Mm. So you learned something from it, but there's no way that that kind of plan could be sustainable, even though I suspect they, they probably would have a maintenance plan on offer, but I don't see how that kind of system can be sustainable long term. Yes, they they kind of had a transition plan, which I did find very, very helpful in uh, switching over off the pa their package plan. And then I just from there, after reading Rob's book, I wanted to try uh, the paleo. Now, in that first year, I realized that paleo included a lot of dried fruits and nuts and higher carb things. It wasn't necessarily a low carb plan, depending on how you ran it. Although because I had Hashimoto's disease, I figured out in that first year, year and a half that I couldn't have dairy uh, by doing a, a couple of uh, elimination periods with dairy. And my second elimination period included dairy and nuts. And when I went to bring nuts back in, I just, uh, I just couldn't stop binge eating. Uh, recently, I've tried to add nuts back in just even tiny, tiny amounts of macadamia nuts, uh, maybe an eighth of an ounce weighed out on a scale. And it just, it just caused me to have two or three weeks of binge urges. So I really, that's interesting. It's not any kind of allergic reaction. You you could eat them and be, and be completely fine health wise, but from a mental point of view, right. it just throws you completely off. Throws me off. And with dairy, it's more of a, um, a mucus production problem. So that's such an interesting idea, actually, because, you know, I've seen many people and I've done it myself, done an elimination diet to, to work out if things affect you. And 
I know that actually dairy does affect me, but not too badly, especially if I can stick to zero carb. So, you know, it, it doesn't have any lactose in it. And there's, you know, there's a remarkable selection, actually. And I found that I can quite easily push it up to sort of less than 1% and it's fine. But it, it's the kind of low level response. I'm a bit mucusy as well, that to be honest, I put up with because I love cheese so much. <laughs> but I do try and keep it down a bit. But what I was going to say was that it's really interesting that you're talking about doing an elimination diet for cravings and binge eating urges and that's such a cracking idea and I yeah I'd, I'd really like to do that because fascinating and you can't tell when you're eating a whole mix of things exactly which are the trigger foods can you no that's right and uh, oftentimes there there's nuts in things um, there's a dairy sprinkled in now the dairy doesn't cause cravings although I miss it greatly I almost miss dairy more than I miss uh cereals and grains and things. So, uh, but that's okay. And uh, it is true when you have a mixture. Also, uh, one of the things I learned in, in, over the last five or six years is you have to check product labels closely. I was podcasting with a quit binge e eating uh, podcaster and I was saying I was having some binge urges that day. And he was like, well, is it mouthfeel? What is it? And I said, well, it's this canned coconut product from Trader Joe's. And what they had done is in that product, they had added guar gum and xanthan gum. And it turns out I am highly sensitive to that for binge urges. And guar and xanthan gum are emulsifiers. Now, with soy lecithin, I have that in 85% chocolate. I have no problem, which is wonderful. It's nice and rich. I can have a little bit of it, and I do great. But if I have a teeny bit of guar and xanthan gum, I can really kick up those cravings. And like you said, it's in a mixture. It's very hard to tell. So when you boil your food plan down to real foods like you would in keto, just simple ingredients, then it becomes, I think, a lot easier. Uh, also, just after that interview, just six months after that interview, I had 23andMe testing, and I did see that I have so all the FTO genes, which are considered food addiction genes, and uh, I have many homozygous genes, so two copies, but I have one copy of an extra ghrelin gene. So I have to think that it's a biochemical thing along with some of the habitual uh, habitual things in my brain that is causing it. It's not, it's not a lack of willpower, let's say. Um, but yet, uh, making clear cut decisions, maybe that there is some willpower or some, some choices. So that's where abstaining comes in very, uh, near and dear to my heart. And it really makes a big difference. This is the longest I've ever been at a normal weight. And this last year is the longest I've ever been at, at, you know, plus or minus five pounds. Wow, fantastic! I, th yeah, I think that's I think that's fascinating, and I think where cravings um, and and any kind of on the sort of binge eating disorder spectrum comes in, it probably is for most people a combination of a genetic factor and you know that that more willpower type mm -hmm. mentality. Because like you were saying, there's no way that it would all be to do with willpower when it's a tiny little ingredient that's in something that you wouldn't be expecting it to be in that suddenly induces cravings. So so that that's just this, this pure physical response. It's got nothing to do with your mood or your approach to that food. It's something that's triggered completely unexpectedly. So it's a really good idea to be testing with an elimination diet on these two fronts. That's such a fantastic idea and I'll, I'll definitely be doing it. Did you take the 23andMe to the next level? I know um, Richard Morris has talked about sending it off to Prometheus, uh -huh. is it? One of, yes. one of the companies. Did, did I, you do that second level testing? I did that. I was involved with a paleo group, uh, Paleo Geeks, and they said, yeah, yeah, do this. And it's only $5. So I did. And I learned, I learned things I didn't want to know that I wasn't expecting. But I learned I had two genes for the, I had many double homozygous genes for childhood obesity for, in the FTO area. And, uh, I got the Prometheus report and I started counting. And when I started counting over 12, I think I cried. I think I sat down and cried because 
I could see, I could see exactly why I was overweight as a child. I have a sibling who also did 23andMe and we could, we can compare our genes and he does not have those genes. He does not carry those and he's not had a problem with weight either. And so I understood too, I could look back in either family line and I could see mostly older people in my family. There was one person here or there on both sides of the family. And I just happened to get that gene combo. And then also when I was little, about age four to six, uh, my family ate out a lot, even though we were hiking and very active. I think eating probably the processed, more processed food uh, probably helped those genes to express. But in that same light, I also have those genes, but right now they're not expressing. So the expanded report gave me a lot of relief in knowing it wasn't my fault. So I did get made fun of a lot on the playground and by my classmates. And anytime you're different in central Indiana, you got made fun of. So <laughs> yeah, tell me a bit more about that because we were discussing this before the show. So you were what age and obese at, at school? I was about age six. That's when I felt like I didn't have the normal on and off signals. I was just hungry all the time. So I wanted to eat all the time. I was always food seeking. We're back in the 70s now. And we, yes. were, we were discussing how it really was unusual. And, and I was saying there, there was one obese child at, at my primary school, but there was literally one. one. It really stood out. If you look at my school pictures, I, one may, there might have been two. There might have been one other boy in my class who was also obese, but I was the only one. And um, it, it was very frustrating. As I got closer to puberty, I did lean out. I also took up jog things like jogging, and I did some unhealthy things like only eating graham crackers and grapes uh, during the time when Lo Luke and Laura got Interesting married. Interesting combination. <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> yeah. In the late 70s or early 80s, the, the soap opera uh, General Hospital was on, and Luke and Laura were getting married, and I was eating grapes and graham crackers and running in the in the 80 and 90 degree heat in central Indiana. So when you're young, you can get away with a lot. And just the calorie reduction probably helped me out. And the, the carbs probably fueled me on my running. But also during that time, we had a lot of blizzards, the blizzard of 78. And to, to spend time in the mornings on school delay, or when we had the mornings off, we would take turns making these homemade breakfasts at home. And that's when I realized one of the times I realized that eating real food helped me slim down. And that helped me get thinner for my my high school years. Uh, I was pretty much a, close to a normal weight, but I was, it was hard for me because I was always wanting to eat or binge eat. You've had these cravings right from well, way back as, as long as you can remember. Sure. And I remember one Christmas uh, uh, handing off to my sibling, my whole stocking full of candy and saying, well, I if I if I eat one piece, I'm going to eat the whole all the candy all today. And he's like, "Are you sure? Are you sure you want to give me this whole stocking full of candy?" And I was like, "Yeah, just take it because I'm in my room on the cold winter floors doing Richard Simmons uh, exercises because he was the only book and and there was a picture of an overweight person in the book and I was just terrified and I knew that if I didn't do exercises on the fl hardwood floors of my room during the winter in Indiana, I was going to be and the funny thing is is I did end up being that obese and I did look like that person." And, uh, but, but that's okay. I mean, it, it is what it was, but I was somewhat aware of it. I was going to say, so you were aware at, at quite an early age that these kind of foods were causing you a problem. When you talk about handing over that stocking full of sweets, you were, how old were you then? In, in your teens, presumably? Yes, I was in my teens. I was probably about 13. That's really quite a profound awareness to have. Yes. At that age. And we spoke about willpower and, and potentially thinking you have the lack of it. But that to me, for a 13 year old, it shows incredible willpower to, to give her stocking full of sweets to her brother. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and, and to, to kind of know. And then uh, the, when I sold candy bars for a fundraiser, I knew that if I start, if I had one at the start, I would want to, I would, and I, I wouldn't steal the money or anything. I would pay the money in out of my own allowance, but it's like, I'm going to, it's going to be a mess. I'm going to gain weight. I like my, my, uh, you know, uh, normal size jeans. I love those. And so I ended up having one caramel bar at the very end and it worked out great. I had it. 
Uh, it was summertime. I just went out for a lot of jogging. I ran six miles instead of four that day or whatever. And it turned out just great. And I made a lot of money. But I suppose also once the supply had gone, the, the problem would have been if you'd have, start, if you'd have had that bar at the start you'd have been and I would do the same you'd be digging into the supply and then oh goodness right I've got to pay for that now and then I've got to get a load more because I've got to sell some more and then you know then you're going to have to face that struggle every day of eating and having to pay for your own supply (laughs) exactly (laughs) leaving it leaving it right to the end where you've done all the selling and Mm -hmm. just have one left I mean that's actually a very sensible approach isn't it yes yes and it so it finally dawned on me when I was doing that package plan for the 40 weeks is that, hey, I'm not eating any of the stuff. I'm not having binge urges. I'm not having cravings most of the time. Uh, I did have some during Christmas. And so that was more of a behavioral sort of soothing thing. And I have no idea why. Um, it might have just been the stress of the holiday or or what have you. But I realized that those certain foods did cause me to want to overeat. And then in the book, Refuse to Regain, uh, the author, Dr. Berkeley, recommended not going back ever, uh, being tough, not moderate. She didn't say abstain uh, because uh, she said, pick a food that is enjoyable that you won't overeat on and have a little bit every day. Uh, For me, that was 85% chocolate and not much else. Uh, So I've kind of stuck with that. I think, in the past, when I was doing the points counting, it was it was based on moderation. And I, w- I felt like I needed group support. So I did go back to Weight Watchers as a lifetimer. It was free during the, the getting off the package plan and going on to low-carb paleo. But other people in the group would speak up about moderation, about frosted chocolate cake. And on the first time around when my daughter was young, I had a leader who talked about abstaining. Someone would ask her, uh, how much is, how many points are, is the pizza at Costco? And she'd say, can you stop eating the pizza at Costco? And the person would say, no, and that could have been me too. Pizza was a, a, the gluten in the, in the crust was a binge trigger. And she goes, well, it doesn't matter how many points it is. You can't eat that. If you want to lose weight and maintain weight, you can't eat the pizza. So don't ask me how many points that is. That's the kind of leader I needed. Well, the points counting is all around moderation. That leader who advocated moderation, and that's what the company sold at the time, is moderate eating. I was going to say, I think I think they still do, don't they? Yeah. It's uh, you know one of one of the catchphrases is that you know there's there's nothing you can't have. It's it's just a case of um, you know how many points it's got or how many sins with a different company or however however it works. Is that as long as you stick to the numbers, it's okay, which is effectively calorie counting isn't it i mean it is as calories and calories at home the the same thing but that's and that was kind of going away from that mentality the leader you were talking about before who who was talking about abstaining and that and and i mean what a sensible approach to combine with that program because it is a popular program and a lot of people you know do do well on it but to actually pick out that thing that is going to make a lot of people not do well to say, is that something that you can stop eating after you've got to your, I I don't know exactly how it works, but however your three points or whatever it is for that slice of pizza, will you be able to easily stop? If you can, then that's the number of points it's got and that's going to work for you. If you can't, then it might as well have a thousand points. You can't Exactly. That's something that you've got to strike off your list. That's you know, that's actually a very sensible approach, isn't it? Exactly. And the people within the group support, and I even like the the leaders down the road, but I, I couldn't be in a room where they were passing out little one, uh, two or three point bars. And when I turned it over, it was it was a candy bar. And I'm like, why am I sitting in a room of really nice people? And they're handing me a candy bar. And one of the, one of the people spoke up and said I had frosted chocolate cake and I couldn't stop eating. And so I raised my hand. I said, "Oh, I said that's me. I've learned to not eat frosted chocolate cake because I can't stop eating it. It affects me two to three weeks down the road." And I got yelled at. The leader came over to me and yelled at in my face and and screamed about having the yes, we could all moderate. 
uh, frosted chocolate cake and everybody should should plan on doing that. You can't abstain for the rest of your life. So I gather, gather my things and I left the room and I never went back. Uh, I was horrified, but I, I could see the look in the person's eyes and the people in the room. And they knew, some of them knew that I was probably telling the truth and I was trying to be respectful, but it was just my experience. And I just knew that I couldn't be in the situation where I was being told to moderate. So I just didn't go back. The people are great. And even the leader, I like her too, but, uh, and, and she's a successful moderator. But I, I do think that programs, any program, any, any weight loss program or weight maintenance program, uh, should, uh, screen their members for abstaining versus moderating. With Gretchen Rubin coming on board and talking about abstaining and moderating, I think that maybe that is something for the future. That can be done. And even within the keto group, a lot of people can moderate uh, certain things, but a lot of people can't. And for the people who can't, who have never gone through that, I've had many years of experience of going through this and uh, finding my own voice and, and uh, doing what I need to do. But a lot of people are new to that. And uh, I think that that might be a, a good place to, to discussion to have. Are you a senior or a moderator? And then uh, sort our, freely sort ourselves into different subgroups within the group. No, I think that's, that's absolutely right. And that would be a beneficial, a very beneficial thing to any kind of weight loss system that you were approaching to find out which you were. Because... You know, in theory, any plan can work. There are so many different plans to to help you lose weight, help you regain your health if you've if you've got problems. And although obviously we're we're slightly biased towards towards keto because it does seem to work like magic for pretty well everybody. But it's not the perfect solution for everybody and 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 you know, other people have, have their own perfect solutions. But to approach it from that abstainer, moderator perspective, I think is going to give you a much better chance of success, whichever plan you choose to follow. Indeed, I agree. It's great advice. Uh, so let's go back a little bit. You were talking about being diagnosed with Hashimoto's in the late 90s, I believe. Why did you think to go looking for that diagnosis or or was it something that was was recommended that you were tested for in the first place well it it came on probably over two to three years i was newly married at the time and i started to gain weight uh which you know i kind of yo-yo dieted so that wasn't so unusual but i started to feel very very tired and not like myself at all and I was at a hairdresser's and she wrapped the towel around my neck and I could feel a butterfly shaped uh, uh, yeah. a pressure in my neck. And I'm a, I uh, am a licensed medical technologist and I do lab testing for a living. And I was working in the lab at a time in an immunology lab and coagulation lab. So I knew it's like, well, what would be in my neck that would be causing that? At first, you think the worst tumor. No, no, it's not a tumor. Uh, but it's like, oh, butterfly in your neck. That's thyroid. And my dad had had Graves disease when he was my age. It was, I was, uh, around 30, 31, early 30s. So, and my grandmother had had thyroid cancer. And then her mother had a goiter. So, okay. So I went to the doctor and they said, hey, this is just subacute. It's going to go away on its own. But in the meantime, really? <laughs> I, I, st <laughs> I started to have a huge goiter and I was, you know, in my early thirties and I was trying, I was falling asleep at the very end of dinner. Uh, when I would go to leave the house in the morning, I would tell my husband at the time, uh, good, good night instead of goodbye. Uh, I drove to Costco near my house and I couldn't, I had three items to get and I couldn't remember what those three items were when I got in the store, I remembered two of them and checked out and got to the car back into the car and going from the checkout to the parking lot. I didn't even know if I could remember where I parked and I was in my early thirties. Something was just wrong. I was falling down all the time. My hair was brittle. Uh, my cheeks were kind of felt like I had paraffin wax in them. Uh, I had some numbness and tingling. 
uh, and just so, so tired. My face would, I would fall asleep after dinner. My face would hit the, the dinner plate, the leftovers in the dinner plate. And uh, it was just not a fun time. I was also about 60 pounds overweight. So I um, kept getting blood tests done. And finally, the director in my lab looked at my neck and he says, I'm tired of looking at your goiter. And I said, I'm tired of having a goiter. He goes, how about uh, I'll see you as a patient. And so he took my history and it was all done uh, within the law. In California, you have to have a doctor uh, see you as a patient and write an order. And so one of my colleagues ran the test. She was working right across from me and about halfway through the day, she stopped talking to me and wouldn't look at me at all. And so so I, I kind of knew at that point. And later in the day, the doctor came and got me and we met and he had a microscope in his office and he said, well, just peek through. He said, I'm not supposed to show you your own antibodies, but peek through. And on IFA, I could see I had one to 80 antimicrosomal. So he wrote a letter to my doctor who was very angry. She was horribly angry that I had sought a second opinion. And I said, well, it's okay to get a second opinion. And I said, now you need to send me to the endocrinologist. Oh, I suppose I could. Well, yes, you will. So the endocrinologist uh, did end up treating me. He waited for my TSH to get much higher. I remember the commuter train coming and I felt like I could stop going to work. And I felt like I just wanted to get in front of the commuter train rather than try to go to work and work through the fatigue and the fuzzy mindedness. So Finally, my TSH got so high, he said, oh, I've got bad news. You've got Hashimoto's disease. And I'm like, well, yes, I do. I have antibodies. And it was right as TPO antibodies were coming out. My lab didn't run them, but uh, clearly my doctors weren't interested in getting me better. So uh, I finally said, hey, wait a second. This is a top endocrinologist in a top medical system in San Diego. Uh, something's wrong with this. So I asked to be transferred to somebody who could adjust my dose, my thyroid dose. And so I have my current doctor. She's great at adjusting my do dose. But the good thing is, is I haven't had to have my dose adjusted. I am on 100 micrograms of levothyroxine. I have been for 20 years now. Right. So you just take T4 because I found that T4 on its own, I was diagnosed back in my 20s with an underactive thyroid, but it wasn't until about 20 years later that I was tested here in France and they found out that I had Hashimoto's and I actually pushed um, to do extra testing for free T3 and free T4 after doing a lot of um, reading on the internet the Stop the Thyroid Madness website yes. and book is where I start which is just phenomenal and and I actually asked my doctor you know can I have these tests and after doing that and discovering that I needed the T3 as well it was only when I started taking the T3 with the T4 that I actually noticed a significant improvement I never had symptoms as acute as yours but that's where I'd actually been to an endocrinologist and they wouldn't do those tests. It was my GP who is fantastic at, at working with me. as long, And he, he must be sick of me because I go in as, right. So I've been looking on the internet, reading this stuff on the internet. Can I have this test or that test? But but actually, as long as I'm being sensible, he'll he'll do it and, and he'll work with me. And And I just think with thyroid disorders in particular, that it's so important to work not just with the blood tests, but with the symptoms. And you have to treat the symptoms. So even if the blood tests are telling you one thing, which mine often do, mine often the T3 is actually right at the top of the scale, if not slightly over. And so, but my GP will say to me, are you getting hyper systems rather than um, symptoms mm -hmm. rather than hypo? And I say, no, I'm not. And he says, well, okay, so I'm fine with you staying at that level. So, you know, he, he uses the blood test results as an informative tool, but he also takes into account my symptoms and mixes the two together. And that sounds exactly <laughs> that they weren't doing with you. You had this, this textbook list of acute symptoms and yeah. they were refusing to take those into account because you didn't have the blood test result that they were looking for, which, which is 
insane. And it took, it took several months for me to, for my TSH to get up to almost nine. Um, and then my current doctor, she go she does what your current GP does. And mine's an internist. She does use my symptoms. If I have, I usually just get my TSH checked and that, but if I have any symptoms at all between times, she'll order up the full thyroid panel so we can look at free T3, uh, free T4 and to make sure everything. And I have had two or three times where I have felt more tired or a little bit more hyped where my TSH has has gotten too low, which means I was a little too hyper. And uh, my doctors warned me that, that I could have bone or heart problems if I have too much th- thyroid mat. So, uh, but, uh, you know, I've gone through being obese, pregnancy, um, and then now normal weight and the aging, I went through menopause also without a dose change. So I was told by the original doctor that uh, ordered the right tests that I would eventually probably need my dose increased. So, so far, so good. We'll see what happens. But um, yeah, it, it's very frustrating to work with people who are supposedly experts. And back in the day, there weren't, there were, I don't know if the thyroid madness, madness book had come out in 90. 798 because I was looking for every resource I had. We had a little iMac and I used that to Google things. We had uh, web access and I tried and tried to find, but I did find people starting to talk about thyroid subacute and that you could be in the upper TSH range, which would be normal for many people, but for people like us, maybe not. So um, I usually run about 1.5, maybe 2.0. If I get up into the threes, I start f- having symptoms. So I'm still subacute, uh, but uh, everything's managed pretty well. And I, I do think uh, being on keto helps helps me with that. Uh, helps me understand my energy levels too, that I'm energetic. And if I start to to get a lot of fatigue, then that's a sign to get to my doctor sooner rather than later. That, that's actually a great thing about thyroid, isn't it? And, and the longer experience you have of the, of the symptoms, that's your best way to diagnose where your thyroid function is at, is by how you're feeling. And you then can go and back that up with some blood tests and change your medication dose if you need to. But really, when it comes to thyroid, you are your own expert on this because it's it's you who knows how you feel. Absolutely. And I had uh, two very close friends have thyroid problems a couple of years after me. And I, I had uh, I had been reading online. And I told them, hey, I'm just on one thyroid medicine, but you might need a second medicine. At the time they were in central Ohio, they had to drive all the way to Detroit to find the doctors to treat them. But they were both really, really glad because neither of them felt well, just like you, on one medication alone. And uh, thankfully now, uh, I believe that they can get medical treatment much their they're in Indiana and they can get medical treatment much closer to their house and that, that adding in two medicines has become much more standard practice. So thank goodness for all of us. But I can't imagine how uh, people lived uh, without um, getting the right medication dose. Absolutely. I mean, with the symptoms you had, I mean, for me, it was just a, you know, a much, a much lower level, but all over you know, mm-hmm. feeling a bit crappy and, and not functioning as as well as I could do, but, you know, didn't stop me functioning and, uh-huh. and living properly. But your symptoms, I mean, really, were getting to the point where you simply couldn't function. I remember telling my uncle, who's an MD, I said, I felt like I was 31, but I felt like I was 81 or 91. And he said, well, when you get to be 81 or 91, you'll feel a lot better than you did without thyroid medicine. <laughs> Back when you're 30. <laughs> so that gave me a lot of hope. You know, I, I, I was still able to function. Um, but yet, uh, it, life is so much better on the right dose. Absolutely. So, yeah, so you went from there into, um, you know, losing some weight, but then you regained, am I right? And And that's when you had this wake up call with your friend who died from type 1 diabetes and was that why you thought to get some labs done to to see if you had pre type 2 uh yes and i my company offers a wellness uh, package for the lab work and we have to we don't have to but we get a super deep discount i think it's up to 40 or 60 dollars a month now or actually it's a paycheck it, it's huge amount of money um, all the time. 
And, uh, e- you know, each month we get discount back if we have the lab work done. And he, this person I knew died from complications of type one. It was kind of, uh, it, it was a really tough thing. It was very sudden. And, I, but I knew I was having a, some shortness of breath. I could see on my lab work that my glucose was almost a hundred. My hemoglobin A1C was 5.7. And in the US, that, that be in my weight, I um, peeked in the screen of my doctor's office and saw that I was coded in as type two obesity, which is in that next BMI level. My BMI was just right at 35, I think, uh, because I'm very short. Uh, so the extra 70, three, two or three pounds. Just, it was an incredible impact on my body. My doctor had started to tell me, hey, you're not having trouble now, but you will. My blood pressure would be high at certain points of my life, borderline high. And so I, I would have been diagnosed pre, which uh, lots of doctors like to remind me that uh, pre-diabetes is diabetes. That you know that that you're you've got it and you're gonna have to deal with it. This whole you know pre label, it it just means well, you're there now. You yeah. you started. Yeah. You're you're <laughs> in that zone. Exactly. There's no sort of pre about it. There's no sort of relatively safe pre zone. <laughs> you're there. You no. need to do something about it. Exactly. So I knew that I needed something low glycemic. And uh, uh, luckily, I was on the package plan for just about 10 to 12 days. And then I went to see my doctor. So when they did that blood work, I had been on it maybe two to three weeks. And I was able to not have that on my uh, on my medical record. So that was that was good. But yet when I got off of the packaged plan and started eating, say, like a lot of dates for uh, paleo, I could see that my abdominal fat, the the visceral fat was starting to come back again. And then once I got my 23andMe results and saw that along with on the FTO gene is also all the type 2 diabetes genes. And so I knew how close I was to it, or I probably had it, had type 2, pre, pre-type 2 or type 2. But I knew that if I didn't do something that was very uh, uh, tough, not moderate, around my glucose and my eating, that I would I would be back at it and developing. And I was over I was obese so long. I can't say that I can't know in the future. I won't need to be on metformin. But rock on wood, right now my hemoglobin A one C is four point eight. Also, when I was overweight, right at the time my friend died of type one complications. Uh, it was very hot and I had a somewhat physical job and I still have that job where I have to take clients around from building to building. But one of my buildings is down a quarter of a mile of the hill. And I, it was it's sometimes a hundred degrees in the summer or over a hundred degrees. And I knew walking clients around, I was just going to keel over. So that was a lot of my motivation to go. It's just, I didn't want to deal with being a single parent and having my fin- finances go to my health care or to having, I used to work with a Jocelyn diabetes clinic. I would go over to the clinic to do lab tests. I would also do lab tests at the bedside during dialysis or right before dialysis started for some patients. So you could really see what your potential future was if you didn't make some changes. I went to the pathology room and surgical to get lymph nodes for uh, leukemia and lymphoma, and they would show me all the amputated limbs from the complications of diabetes. I was working, it was an inner city in Indianapolis at the time. It was, you know, a, a mix of, of different people. And I could see how, you know, just poverty too affected people and their ability to uh, get well, take care of themselves, eat the right kinds of food. So I kind of, I kind of got a great education during that time, but I knew I was headed there myself and I, I just didn't want to. I wanted to, uh, see my daughter live and I wanted to save for college too. So I Absolutely. wanted to save, save my money. So, so you found that you were having to adjust paleo, that, that paleo was obviously working for you and you were happy with it it was it was good to lose the the gluten especially from a Hashimoto's point of view Um, but that it potentially wasn't low carb enough so presumably that's when you started transitioning to keto I believe you went to went to a conference low carb USA was that sort of when it changed in your mind I've you know I've got to make this jump from paleo to keto Yes, it was kind of a progression. And I, 
had gone to Paleo FX in 2015, and back in 2013, I had met Jimmy Moore in person. He was in San Diego at an obesity conference, and he, I had talked to him a little bit, so I followed his podcast. And at the 2015 Paleo FX, there was a big showdown. There was a big talk about being low carb, not even keto at the time, low carb versus uh, higher carb paleo or more or <laughs> fruit based or starchy tubers based paleo. Big showdown. Really? I, oh <laughs> man, it a, was just bit of a gunfight, was it? Oh, totally. <laughs> Every the the whole hall, the big hall was just packed with everybody listening to it. But it it dawned on me that I had enough information. I had my 23 and me result and I knew what what eating dried fruits did to me and how sick I was gonna get. So I'm like, well this doesn't I, I mean, people really need to apply this individually. Uh, so it kind of be at the, the end of the whole thing, it made me want to go just back to the, the cooking demos. I probably would have learned more there. But that's great because it, it really started cementing things in your mind that some things were working for you, some things weren't, that you needed to start making that switch. And to have the sort of two systems there in front of you arguing things out is actually really useful and informative, isn't it? Because you can hear the, the different arguments for the different foods, the different carb limits, and start to see what works and what doesn't work for you. So, th so actually, that must have been quite a key moment. It, it was. It really was. And the person um, who was arguing for the higher carb, she's really well known. And I was with one of my roommates. I had roommates at the time that I didn't know, but we all just came together for the conference. And it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And we were all different age groups. This is the first time I was the oldest person in the group. Uh, but we talked to one of the, the, the higher carb advocate who's well known and well respected. And I, I love her too. And she said, she didn't do as well on a on a lower carb plan, but the other person did do better for a while anyway on the lower carb plan. And uh, it, it it was good to hear her side of it. I could appreciate that we were all different and that that I knew what was important for me and that that was okay. And I still felt like I felt it fit into that group just fine because I was going to need to be dairy free. And when we went out to eat with the group, I, I felt totally fine. Now, some of the people in my group at dinner weren't always good with me moderating because I don't, I don't know if you know, but when you go to paleo conferences, a lot of times they use that time to go eat ice cream with friends and uh, things that maybe aren't paleo. So it's kind of a, di it's kind of a dichotomy. It's kind of a, a, a back and forth, but it but it is vacation time and it is a, a special time with friends. Um, but I uh, people would say, "Oh, aren't you going to have the X, Y, and Z?" And I'm like, "Well, no, I can't." And uh, and uh, or I I don't feel good when I do that. I would get really sick. So so there was a little bit of that going on. But by the time I reached Low Carb USA in 2016 in San Diego, which is wonderful, I can it's in, I live in San Diego County. So I can just take the train down and go to the conference. Uh, low carb, of course, it was the focus on low carb. And I felt like that was my place to be. Now, in 2016, I had regained about eight to 10 pounds. And it was very frustrating. But also in that summer, I uh, latched on to Dr. Panda at the Salk Institute in La Jolla. He has an app, uh, My Circadian Clock. And it is a 10 week or it was 14 weeks rather of baselining the first two weeks and then doing 10 weeks with photographing everything with your phone and it, taking your eating window. I baselined at 12 hours. I was already fasting for 12 hours, but I took that down and narrowed it to about 16 to 17, maybe even 18 hours over 10, uh, 12, 12 weeks. And at the end of that, I had lost about eight pounds. And I really hadn't changed the amount I was eating or any type of food that I was eating. And some of the results, I know Rhonda Patrick of Found My Fitness talks to Dr. Panda a lot. Um, also, Ruth Patterson, she's a doctor uh, in San Diego, a PhD. Uh, and she has a YouTube video out talking about how they don't change people's food templates, but they do change the amount of time that they're eating. And that's a lot easier within, say, different cultures who may want to have corn or they might be rice based and things like that. So they don't necessarily have to change, but they get into a mild ketosis and that that helps them with whatever they have. For some people, they had less breast cancer reoccurrence and some of the numbers were better than tamoxifen. So for me, that's huge. It's like, here's something. And they were talking about how people were limited finances 
and they're getting great benefits. So that was really a convincing thing to me that it is a good thing. So I don't fast every single day, but I do do a lot of 16-8 fasting where I, I'll start eating in the morning and putting my carbs, any carbs that I'm going to have, putting them up in the morning seems to really help. I had tried to carb backload, which I know works for a lot of people in, in the keto community. But for me, I can eat a few more carbs and still remain keto. I woke up this morning having not fasted. Uh, I had some kale last night at about 6 a.m. So at, at 11 hours down the road, I was still 1.1 on my keto meter, on my uh, ketone meter. I don't test ketones that much, but it is, I'm getting ready to go th through another uh, back to back 16 8 where I just eat from 6 a.m. and stop eating around uh, noon to 1 o'clock, 17 7, however that works out. And uh, I could get a little higher ketone levels, but I'm just looking to see how I feel. I also weighed in this morning at the highest, my highest weight for the year. But I can see on my, the scale that I have has body weight percentage on it. And I'm at one of the lower body weight percentages. And I started doing push-ups this year. Uh, uh -huh. at the, at so the you've last... increased your muscle mass, maybe. I think so, because I tried on the dress I'm going to wear for my daughter's graduation, and I can feel a little bit of maybe of extra weight, a pound or two, but I'm about four or five pounds more than when I bought this dress over the summer, and it fits maybe even better than it did before. So that's an, finally an example. I know, you know, it's kind of cliche, oh, it's muscle weight, but I think in my case, it very well could be. Now, I do find that if I get over a certain weight on the scale, that I can start going up and up and up. So that's why I am going to, to get back to um, more fasting. And it does raise my ketone level. And I do, I get a lot of housework done. When, I, when I'm in <laughs> keto, I have a lot of energy. I'm clear-minded. I like the way I feel. Uh, I do have a little bit of joint pain from being obese for, for 40 years on and off. So I have some knee pain sometimes, sometimes some elbow pain or joint pain. And I do find that my pain levels reduce and I don't take anything for it. I, before I started my uh, package plan and losing weight, I was taking somewhere 350 ibuprofen a year. I had one of those huge bottles from Costco and it was mostly gone. And I couldn't believe I have, I don't think I've taken ibuprofen since 2015. Yeah, it's not good to take too much, is it? No, I had migraines too. And, and, uh, you know, going through menopause helped that because, um, I, some of mine was estrogen related. When my estrogen would dip, I would tend to get headachey, but I had headaches all the time. Now I realized too, when I took out dairy and my migraines really, they went away for good. The only time I'll start to get a migraine is if I'm dehydrated. That happened at Paleo FX. I was in Austin. It was super hot. And all I did was once I figured it out is I went and I chugged a bunch of water and the headache goes away. Yeah. And often a bit of salt as well, some salt and some water and it goes away. I read the book, The, the Salt Fix, James D. Nicolantonio, uh, Dr. Dr. James, the Salt Fix author, and that has helped me tremendously. I use Pink Himalayan, but I also use the Redmond, and he recommends, I think, Ancient Lakes brand as well. Um, but I uh, do like the Pink Him Himalayan. I know he, he likes uh, uh, the mineral water, the Gersh. Dolorminer, I can't say it. Anyway, it's at Trader Joe's for a dollar a bottle here in the U.S. And it has a lot of, of natural minerals. One thing I have changed since I have started going to Low Carb USA and being keto is I did try to take out coconut oil. And that's hard because I'm dairy free. Uh, so I use olive oil on m many of my products, but I was thinking back to eating ancestrally and my ancestors came from, since they did 23andMe, I know they came from Great Britain, Ireland, and they also came from uh, n sort of Northern European or the, the Australia, Germany area. So kind of a mix of both. So I also uh, have some sort of a poor reaction to pork. <laughs> So I can't have bacon, oh, but no. I, I can eat it. It's not an allergic reaction, but I kind of puff up. I love the way it tastes. So once or twice a year, I will have some bacon and it just, it's wonderful. I like it, but I'm not like hooked on it sort of in a bad sort of way. Um, 
I know my ancestors would have eaten pork for sure. And I love the flavor profile of using a lard. So if there's a little bit of lard left over from cooking bacon for my daughter in the pan with my kale, then I just enjoy those flavors and move along. Um, so, uh, you know, weighing every day, that's what weighing every day has given me uh, is knowing what salts. Some, sometimes I react poorly to different kinds of salts, and I don't know if it's a mineral makeup. I also noticed with big fish like salmon, I can end up with a little bit of positional vertigo a little bit more. With smaller fish like sardines, I don't have any trouble at all. Uh, so I have kind of stuck to the smaller smaller fish and uh, not the big fish. And I learned to like salmon. And it's it's just a shame that I, that I can't eat it. So I have kind of narrowed some of my choices, but yet at the same time, it does seem to uh, work for me very, very well. My HSCRP was 6.8 when I was overweight and short of breath and feeling like I was going to keel over and now it's 0.6. Can you explain what that is? That's a, uh, it's not a specific inflammation marker, but it is a marker of inflammation. Uh, for all I know, I mean, some of that could have been caused by thyroid, but my thyroid was well dealt with at that time. Um, or some of my, say, joint pain. Um, but it is a marker of inflammation, of body inflammation overall. Uh, I do notice when I have coconut oil, my HSCRP runs a little higher. It's normal level here uh, with my reference lab is less than three. And then uh, it's best best to have it below one. Uh, but I, sometimes I'll run around in the twos a little bit. And oftentimes it's just something that I'm eating. So when I get that big bloated feeling from, say, eating pork or um, eating something, that's it's kind of like a poor man's allergy test. So that's that's how I use it. I only get it tested once a year, but I, I do enjoy it. And I notice that that if I eat non-berry fruit, I, I do have berry fruit in the summertime, especially if I'm hiking, run across a raspberry or blackberry bush, I will have fruit. Um, I have felt like I have a little bit of cranky joints sometimes with fruit. So uh, uh, when I cut the oranges off, cut slices of oranges for my daughter, then I might take that and squeeze it a little bit or lemon or lime juice in dressings. And that seems to be okay for me. So I can get the flavor, the essence of, and of course it smells wonderful, but I don't just chow down and eat a whole orange. I, I don't think I'd feel very good after that. Uh, I do fall out of ketosis a little bit uh, from time to time. I can tell because I do test my blood on and off. Uh, I seem to be able to get right back in, though. And is that to do with what you're eating or other issues, do you think? I think so. I think that sometimes I'll, I'll go a lot higher carb with vegetables um, or may it, vegetables and 85% chocolate and this or that. Every once in a while, I'll have a day where I'm just super, super hungry. So I just go ahead and eat on template foods. But when I go higher carb on those days... That's when um, I, I find, and then also if I have poor sleep around that, then uh, that can kind of, those th all those things and stress. And I do notice that during really big business meetings, if I feel like I'm not on my game or it's something brand new and it's really high stakes business at work, I can have binge cravings. They'll pop through. And I think that that's more of an emotional thing where I'm I'm looking to soothe with food. I think... I'm almost six years out into weight maintenance, and this is my seventh season for like being abstaining at Christmas time. So the first couple of Christmases, I had a lot of binge urges, and I just dealt with them by uh, playing computer games or going upstairs, going away from the kitchen. Um, so there is some emotional working, and someone on my blog keeps saying, uh, someone who's who's been in this and uh, maintaining their weight longer than me, they're like, oh, it's it's a lot of neuro connectors. There's a lot of uh, habitual things going on, and you're going to have to learn to break away from those messages that uh, that your brain's telling you. And I can say that yes, uh, six seven years down the road, I I don't have those cravings, and I don't even think about it anymore. Um, it's not popping up, but I did I did have a business meeting earlier. Uh, no, it was late last year, rather, in November. And for the first 15 minutes of of the start of right before we started that meeting, it was like it was the old me. And it's like, oh, and I try to ask myself, I try to get to the root because I know genetics is a root cause of my obesity. Uh, so is overeating. But the trigger for overeating, you know, if you ask why five times and kind of a root cause analysis, I know that um, stress. And so immediately I knew 
uh, that was stress. And in one of my support groups, they say, put something keto in your mouth. And so I had beef sticks, I had chomp sticks, and then I usually have avocado or gu frozen guacamole hanging around. So I grabbed a chomp. A beef stick out of my backpack, ate that. It felt a lot better. I still felt a little uh, bingy, but I didn't feel like I was going to lose my marbles or or eat something I shouldn't and say, "Well, you know, it's okay. I can I can do this right now and be okay." Because I know I can't. That slippery slope thinking still comes into play sometimes, and so I just have to be really careful and watch for it. But I have it so little of a time, I can I can almost always stop and say, "Holy smokes." Uh, uh, this is just my binge brain talking to me and I need to stop. And that did happen to me three weeks after my dad passed away in 2013. I was on a cruise. I had lamb, uh, wonderful lamb chops. And the, the chef, I worked with the, the head chef and they prepared everything sugar free. But at, on that meal, they put the mint jelly on. And even my daughter said, Mom, you don't usually eat that. And I go, it's okay. I'm fine. I, it's just a tablespoon. I'll be fine. I wasn't fine. I had a lot of binge urges that day. I felt awful. My daughter was disgusted with me and walked away. And she goes, mom, come on. Ah. And she was, you know, an early teen. So she just walked off. And as she should have. Uh, but that night, I just realized I laid on my on my bed and, and just felt awful. And it's like, I could either go back to the old or I could go into the new. And the new is going to be hard. But the old was awfully hard as well. And and I, so at that time, it was an Alaskan cruise. So I could go to the, um, to go and with my camera and immerse myself in photography and looking for eagles and just checking out the landscape and running the stairs there and on the ship, on the cruise ship. And that, I, I just started abstaining. And so that was a, a lapse, a, a, a small lapse. Is it relapse? this worse or lapse so I had a lapse and I've had a lapse or two here or there when when big emotional things happen but I also have learned to, to phone a friend to call somebody and I have friends like all over the world now that I could just call or just get on a support group and say I'm having this you know and I feel like I'm 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 going past the point of no return and uh, I'm within a group of people who know me who can say don't do that. And now I know from that one experience with the mint jelly on the cruise with my daughter, I know if somebody who knows me really well is telling me that, I better listen. So <laughs> it's actually quite useful, isn't it? To uh, as bad as they can be, to have gone through those experiences because you can then look back and see very clearly what the consequence is. So the next time that kind of situation arises, and it was it was something I was going to ask you how to deal with that kind of situation. But you know that that's exactly what what you've been talking about is what happens when your particular trigger situation arises, and it sounds like with you the one that's most likely to trigger cravings is a stressful situation. It might be exacerbated by having had poor sleep and maybe eating slightly higher carb than usual and, and different factors might come in, but the real big one is a stressful situation. Um, but it sounds like you have several different things that you do. It, it sounds like you think very deeply. You have that self-diagnosis moment as you were talking about, to really try and figure out what's going on, what led to that situation. And often when you can see the why and how it came about more clearly, that in itself just makes it easier to deal with, doesn't it? And acknowledging that you've got those cravings, those feelings that are overwhelming you. And certainly it was a, it was a part of the therapy that I did to really listen to the parts of you that are speaking. So if you've got a part of you that's that's screaming out, I need to eat a certain food, I need to eat carby foods, is not to try and simply dismiss that part that's trying to talk to you, but actually to interact with it, which is what you're doing when you when you have the self diagnosis, and then to try and work with it. And that's when you bring in your strategies that you found helpful. So your phone a friend, your yes. distraction with another exercise that's that's usually quite handsy so it's you know yes. your video games yes. or your taking photographs something that's going to stimulate your mind but it's going to literally occupy your hands so they can't be stuffing food in your face basically yes. 
Um, so are, are, there, are there any other strategies that, that you bring into play? One of my triggers was, especially in the first couple of years, was being tired. So sometimes I told myself I had a an index card on the chocolate bin at my house, and I promised myself if I binge ate chocolate, that I'd throw it all away. It's 85%. It's really expensive chocolate. So I'm like, I don't want to do that. But it said something like, uh, the answer is not in here. And I think that card has fallen off, but it's somewhere around up in my cupboard. But for a long time, I think I was I would reach that re- reaching up into the pantry uh, signified I was searching for an answer, but they, it was like a false fix. So Pamela Peak, the sugar fix doctor, talks about sh- false sugar fixes. And so I thought of it that way, is that I'm trying to fix a problem, but it's not the right fix. It's not the right application somehow. And in I work in quality assurance and in the lab, and if you don't get to the root cause, it the problem will keep coming back and and that's uh, not good for anyone so that's the problem it doesn't work does it so you know if you're used to which which I've done for for decades is is being miserable being depressed and reaching for foods that are the so-called comfort foods and really the, in the, in the immediate moment, you might get some comfort. I actually find more the comfort is in the anticipation and, and the, the thinking about it. Because actually, as soon as that food hits your mouth, it doesn't give you the comfort you were anticipating. It actually doesn't taste as good as you were anticipating. And of course, then you start on the slide down to feeling even worse. So you haven't soothed the problem, which was trying to heal the feelings of depression and and feeling miserable you use the wrong thing which only exacerbates the problem so you're you're never going to win that way are you you've got to really do that deep dive and try and figure out what's going on and resolve that issue exactly exactly and that's uh i know that it's a it's a tough concept i know it is addressed i think a lot and one of my uh, learning tools. I had to do quite a bit of learning because I'd never been in weight maintenance. I'd spent 40 years yo-yo dieting. So I really studied it like a subject in school. So I started with the Refuse to Regain book and then went to the paleo book. But I also read, um, I went ahead and got some OA workbooks and I listened to some OA podcasts and their abstaining methods are are very much the same. So I picked up abstaining skills. And then soon after that, uh, Gretchen Rubin's uh, habits, the the habits came out and abstaining was one of them. And I was thrilled because if I understand why there's the anonymous piece, because if you actually say what works, people will just, they'll, they'll blurt it out. They'll say, you're crazy. And it's like, no, no, I'm not. There's millions of people in, in these anonymous groups that it's, it's not popular. It's not popular to, um, to abstain uh, I, uh, in a moderation world. It's just not um, everybody wants to have their points bar and eat it too and, and, and maintain their weight. But, um, but yet it gives me so much, um, so much life back. My, my mind is on my hobbies, on my daughter, I'm playing with my cats, my photography. Uh, it just, it just really gave me m- my life back. And, uh, I know that uh, Dr. Tarman, Vera Tarman, one of the books I read to help understand abstaining a little bit more. She is a, f- a an addiction specialist, both uh, a substance and a food out of Toronto, Canada. And she had a book that came out called Food Junkies. And on it is a cover. I'm very, uh, photography is one of my hobbies. And it's a stack of donuts on the front. So <laughs> when I have the book out, I have to cover it up with post-it notes because yeah. I just, I can't look at the, the it food It can pictures. be a trigger in itself. Literally <laughs> just a picture, can't it? Yeah. So definitely. she talks a lot about uh, abstaining and uh, may- maybe she's also the one that talks about false fixes, false sugar fixes. And she, she is a a, a food addict in recovery, and she talks about you know stealing stealing food off patient trays. This is she talks about it in her book, so I'll talk about it here. But um, she does say that that low carb can help uh, the biochemistry, or, or she I think in her book at the time it was written in 2013, maybe. Uh, but she would be a, a great person to talk to. Uh, 
but she does talk that, that that does turn off the cravings. And so millions of other people I know are in my boat, our boat. And, but for somebody who's a moderator, they don't have that, they don't always have that empathy. So um, it's nice to have a mix or to have a place to go where other people understand, uh, understand why you do what you do. No, absolutely. Okay, so tell me a bit about what your keto looks like, because I think it's, it's really useful for people to hear each individual's keto and, and what it looks like, because we're all so different. It sounds like you incorporate um, intermittent fasting, IF, on a, on a pretty regular basis. So does that mean you eat just, just one or two meals a day? Uh, yes, I typically eat three meals a day, but in a very compact window. Right. I do eat low carb. I have discovered that if I don't eat about 30 grams or more, the cutoff's right around 27. If I eat lower than 27, my GI system gets a little wonky and um, I need my GI system to be well. It's a, it's an unpleasant experience if, if I eat too low carb. Uh, something with my gut mucus there. Wow, for my immunity, I really, I really need that. But my keto looks like about 30 grams of total carbs, maybe for, even 40 or 50, but the net turns out to be about 30. It's all from, uh, green vegetables and chocolate. And sometimes, uh, I can have a few tomatoes here or there. Uh, but I kind of limit the, the higher carb, uh, fruits and vegetables. I have fruit in the summer, so my carbs will run a, a little higher in the summer. Uh, breakfasts look like eggs and kale and maybe some pumpkin seeds, maybe. So seeds are okay. You have a problem with nuts, but you, you're okay with seeds. Some seeds are okay. Sunflower uh -huh. <laughs> seeds are, are definitely a, a binge trigger and have been since I've been little, say at ball games or traveling, camping. We had a lot of sunflower seeds and I binged on those like like there was no end. But uh, So potentially <laughs> there's a bit of a, a mental trigger back, back to childhood with that one. Could be. I, I'm not sure. And I do have to weigh out my pumpkin seeds. I love pumpkin seeds. They're, they're delicious, aren't they? They're really oh, they great are so good. on salads and all sorts. So I like to toast them and, and the yes. flavor. Yeah, incredible. I do like I've them. been sprinkling mine into kale a little bit and sauteing them with some salt mm. and just a tiny bit of, I uh, use olive oil over really, really low heat and it's just delicious. I love that. And, and then on salads as well. Uh, I will have anywhere from three to four or five ounces of meat, depending on how hungry I am. And that can vary. It's usually beef, chicken, or sardines um, for my meat. And sometimes I have oysters and shellfish I love. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, so I don't have it as often. Mm, I have guacamole a lot. I have a lot of avocado here in Southern California. We are so fortunate to have such cheap avocados. People bring them in off their trees and it, it's just a wonderful addition. I do a lot of cruciferous vegetables. I know some people with thyroid can't, but I typically, I cook my cruciferous vegetables and that seems to do just fine for me. So I have a lot of sauteed kale. I have, um, and I drink a lot of water. So, so far so good. Knock on laptop here that I don't have any kidney stones. Uh, my, my family is prone to them on both sides. So, so far, so good. I also have a little bit of 85% chocolate and I'll make salad dressings. I can have a, a tiny bit of balsamic vinegar and that's, that's wonderful too for salad dressings mixed with olive oil. And then I also make my own bone broth and I also buy it boxed in Costco. It just depends on my time and whether or not I have a good chicken around, but I will sip on broth occasionally. So sometimes I make soups or stews and I use my instant pot quite a bit uh, to cook meat, cook it tender. I'd like to batch cook and put it up in the freezer. It's a cheap way to, to uh, get a meal and I always, always bring my own food to work. I, I never eat at work except if I forget my lunch, I will buy lunch, but I buy something from the grill that is just plain meat and then a salad. And I always have olive oil and salt and balsamic sitting around um, for, for use actually by anyone. Uh, so that's what my keto looks like. And uh, that sort of eating regime does keep me anywhere from 0 0.5 to 1.5 on the ketone meter. I know my, my ketones go a lot higher when I fast and I feel pretty good when I fast. So I try to uh, do that as often as I can. Sometimes I don't feel good at night. I feel a little shaky. And then that's just my sign to have a little bit of kale 
And so that's what my keto uh, program looks like. And certainly, yes, obviously a carb level that works for you to keep you in that nutritional ketosis. Yes, I'm very fortunate. I feel that, that I can have some carbs and, uh, you know, I don't mind. I tried doing 20 grams of carbs total and I felt pretty good. I felt good because I was in ketosis, but the rest of my system just revolted. So. <laughs> and that, yeah, that, that becomes a practical thing, doesn't it? Where it's. <laughs> Just a little bit difficult to function when uh, yes. you're going into uh, yeah tummy aches and disaster pants territory. Mm -hmm. It's uh, <laughs> not very sociable, is it? No. Um, so you've been maintaining for a long time now. And I know you've said to me that it's very important to you to maintain at a certain weight. Why is that? Perhaps you could, I mean, obviously, you know, it's nice, but it's something that's very important to you. Yes. Well, I would say the biggest thing is, it's kind of weird. I don't know. It's just that I'm short. And that means that um, I don't have a weight on my joints. If I load up with, say, bags from Trader Joe's shopping, and I uh, just go from the cart to the parking lot to my car, I can feel the ex that, that extra weight, 20 pounds maybe of groceries, 25 max. I'm just carrying that and I can feel it on my joints and it doesn't feel good. So it's essential. It's also essential because I get charged more on my insurance if I weigh more. And um, my, my doctor... She seems like she might be able to write a note for me, but I don't, I don't feel like myself. And when I, and it sounds all woo woo and I'm a scientist, so I don't do a ton of woo, but um, when I dream at night, I'm not the same person. I feel like I'm a different person during the day being overweight than I am. And when I'm uh, normal weight, I feel like I'm the same as I am, as my soul is inside. I don't know how else to say it. And it sounds woo woo, but it's so true for me. And it probably has physical and emotional aspects to it. So I, uh, for all those things, especially the joint pain, though, I think that I think pain is a big motivator. And f having the physical pain on my joints, it's essential that I just uh, do everything that I can to maintain uh, my weight at a normal BMI. Yeah. And, and it sounds like you've also got a slight tolerance zone within that anyway. You mentioned yes. that you were four or five pounds heavier, but that you figure actually that that's probably mostly down to a change in body composition so you're not going to freak out because your weight your ideal maintenance weight has changed slightly if it doesn't mean that your body composition has changed you're you're happy to adapt that number on the scales accordingly it's it's not a fixation with a certain number it's it's the whole bigger picture that's right that's totally right and I kind of I've been doing this long enough now that I tell myself hey this is data I'm gonna plot it I don't always like the number that I see but I record it anyway and even though if I know like I had a little lard in the pan with a kale and my weight's gonna be up maybe a pound maybe even two pounds overnight but it's like okay this is just data I'm gonna record it and move on and then what I do is I look at the four to five data points before to see how I'm trending. Uh, sometimes I need to adjust my intake because I can still not get hungry and full signals. It's very frustrating because maybe 10% of the time I get normal signals and I realize I don't need to eat as much as I'm eating and that that can impact my weight. So I have a Fitbit that I wear. Uh, I have a Charge HR2 and I also keep track on my fitness pal and I have the two talk to each other. And so I can gauge a little bit since I don't get normal signaling. Sometimes it's easier just to set up kind of a, a low activity day, a medium activity day, and a high activity day and eat according to what I know works because I have a lot of experience with it. But then I get normal signals 10% of the time and I'm like, hold up. I am not really needing to eat right now. I don't feel full. I feel sated. And it's like, what is this? And sometimes I get angry. Sometimes I get mad. I'm like, I don't know what brought this normal on. It's probably a hormone signaling. My Maybe my ghrelin's working right that day. But it, I get kind of mad because it's like I have this whole system set up where I'm kind of flying by my instruments, so to speak, kind of like an instrument rated pilot. But now I'm getting normal. And now what do I do? Well, I go with how I'm feeling. Uh, you know, I say, okay, I'm not hungry. I won't eat right now. But sometimes I feel like, well, I have such a good thing going with 
not having normal hunger signals. I just, that's what I want to live with because I'm familiar with it. Much like uh, people who are colorblind who are now getting colored glasses, it, some of them aren't getting colored glasses because they don't want to know what they f- are seeing. They're used to the normal. I know what you mean. Yeah, it throws the normal, doesn't it? And uh-huh. And really, if 90% of the time you're not having those signals, it makes perfect sense to work to a system that you know works based on your data. But why is it you think you're not getting those proper signals? Does that go back to the 23andMe testing you were talking about with the ghrelin markers and things like that? It could. It very well could. I I don't know... I wish I did know, and I know they say weight loss is hormonal. They talk about that a lot at Low Carb USA, that it's a hormonal system. And I don't know about anyone else, but I I get free lab work as a as a benefit to my healthcare, but I have never had an insulin run. My lab does run ghrelin um, in the, within the lab system. I could have that test, but I don't want to force a ghrelin spike and see if it's abnormal. I can guess that that's what's going on. Uh, but if if weight loss and weight maintenance truly is a hormonal, we aren't getting near the right testing that we need. Um, and I don't know if more testing would be good or if you have to do what I've done and what we've done. I know a lot of people are in our same boat where we've used different tools to get what we need to get. But I know when I got to weight maintenance, being overweight at age six, that I have not gotten the right tools to maintain my weight. And I've been told to eat whole grains and to eat higher carb uh, by my health insurance company. And I can't do that. So I don't have when they, they chew you up and spit you out, you're on your own. So a lot of people lose weight, but maintaining it It goes from anywhere from people say 2%, but even I'll hear Dr. Berkeley say higher, more like um, 20% or 40%. And that's maintaining a certain percentage of total off where the, you know, regaining is, is common. But say you don't go back to your old highest weight. That's still considered weight maintenance. Yeah. And I think, I think maintenance to many of us is just such a foreign way of being. You know, a lot of us have spent our whole lives either gaining weight or losing weight and actually getting to a point where you're at the weight you want to be and you've just got to maintain it is a really weird state of being and actually I can see in some ways that having those signals switched off in a way could be advantageous because you can say Right, it's exactly what you were saying. Get your Fitbit to talk to this and and that Mm -hmm. to talk to that. And right, I'm going to make this plan. And on a day when I have a higher activity level, I'm going to eat a bit more. And, you know, you can have it all planned out. And if you haven't got any signals interfering with that, in in a way, it's advantageous because you've switched those cravings off, which are the biggest thing that interrupts. Mm -hmm. And okay, you know, if you have a day when suddenly that 10% switches back on again and says, oh, no, I'm full, don't give me any more food, you can go with that, can't you? But exactly, in a way, it it seems a benefit, certainly to have the other end of the scale switched off. (laughs) I quite like that, I think. (laughs) Yes. I think the most frustrating thing is I don't know when it's going to happen. So I go ahead and just track my food almost all the time. There are some days where I don't track the food where it's just like, oh, man, I'm at the end of the day. I'm feeling pretty good. I don't feel like I'm going to be, I'm just going to go up and go to bed. I'm just going to skip tracking. I'll just be fine because I have enough historic data to get by on what I know. I was going to say, you must have a regular routine now that you don't actually need to. You just like the data and you like tracking and like seeing what happens. It's like you were saying about weighing every day, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I do too. And a lot of people say, throw away the scales, don't they? If you, if you have weight problems and it, I think it, it really depends how you react to, to that number on the scale. But I've just seen it fascinating with how much your weight changes for absolutely no reason. From day to day, you can have a gain or a loss of anywhere up to, you know, a couple of pounds, a, a kilo or so. And and you see how random it can be when there's no reason for that change. No reason. And that's actually quite reassuring mm-hmm. to know that. Mm-hmm. And certainly for me, it's a test of a of my mindset if I'm getting on the scales every day you can bet that if I've gone off plan I'm not getting off this on the scales every day and it's only when I decide right you know this this is it I need to drill back down that's when I get back on the scales and I accept what's going on so it's it's a tricky balance isn't it and I can see why some people do avoid them like the plague but they can also just be a useful guidance tool as long as you don't freak out about the numbers 
Exactly. As long as you, you just say, hey, this is data for informational use only. Absolutely. And it is interesting. Uh-huh. It's, I tend to write my weight on calendars. Uh-huh. And it is interesting looking back yeah. on the years, especially when there was a big change in weight, just looking back to see that pattern. And especially, I'm not very good at tracking food, but especially if you've got any kind of food activity diary going on at the same time to actually see those statistics working together. It's so informative, isn't it? Because it can tell you what you need to do next. It is. And I um, I got into the Heads Up Health space. I don't know if you've heard about Heads Up Health. I have. Yes. Yes. They put all the data together, don't they? And you can analyze it in different ways, presumably. I overlaid my weight with my calories in and things like that. And it was very helpful to see, hey, even though I had taken my food intake really low, I was still gaining weight. And I'm like, oh, hold on here. Something isn't quite right. And that's when I started fasting and getting the benefits. And it's like, well, I really haven't changed the amount of food, but I'm dropping weight like a rock. So um, uh, it was very helpful for me to see that, okay, um, I've got to use a lot of tools in conjunction with each other, and they all have to kind of work together. I might not always understand how they work together, but I need to grab on to tools that work and uh, interchange them as needed. So uh, using that uh, data set, those data, different data sets uh, helped quite a bit. Yeah, I love data. It's fascinating. But we could go on all night, I think, or morning, I think it is for you talking, talking about these things. But we're going to have to bring it up to a close now. So um, perhaps you could leave the listeners with, with your top tip. Oh, my top tip is to, if you haven't already, figured out if you're a moderator or abstainer, and then go ahead and, and live that way and don't make any apologies to anybody. Uh, just own own that as as a trait and, and work within what works in that. Make it make it positive. Make it a positive thing. And don't worry about other people you might be living with moderators, which could be hard. Um, but, uh, just own that for yourself, knowing that you're going to show up in life at your work and with your family, the best version of you you can be and, uh, go ahead and, and live in, in what's, what's authentic to you. And that, that'll make things a lot easier. That's a great tip, actually, to work out which you are, but... If you end up being an abstainer, because I suppose everyone would like to be a moderator, really. I would. So if you, if you end up <laughs> as an abstainer, so the automatic assumption is that that's a negative thing, is actually to lose that association and just, just make it a part of you and to own it and find a positive way to use that so it, it doesn't become this negative label that drags you down, holds you back, makes things awkward. Find a way to push through where it's a positive part of your personality. I think so. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you today, Karen. I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daisy. I appreciate your time and it's been wonderful. Fabulous. get the resources and links from the show, please go to ketowomanpodcast.com. Are you my next extraordinary woman? Maybe you've got an idea for a show, a topic you want to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. If you fancy joining me on this exciting adventure and help create new shows, please go to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Keto Woman, or you can simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman website. It's thanks to the two Keto Dudes that I'm hosting this podcast, so please consider heading to their Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com and help them bring you more podcasts like this one. Please help other people hear about and find this podcast by reviewing the show on iTunes. Every star, preferably five of course, and review helps. This week's quote is from Gretchen Rubin. She seemed a perfect choice after Karen referenced her so much in the interview. I chose this little snippet of a quote because it is a tip that should quite frankly be adopted by everyone. Never start a sentence with the words, no offence. Bye-bye, keto lovies.